Hello and welcome. My name is Paul Post. I'm a non-resident fellow of Foreign Policy and Public Opinion at the Chicago Council on Global Affairs and an associate professor of political science at the University of Chicago. A special thanks to our members for joining us for this panel conversation on the role of modern monarchies in a rapidly changing world. Before we get started, by means of a disclaimer, please note that the Council is an independent and nonpartisan organization and takes no institutional policy positions. Views expressed by participants on the program are their own. If you have a question for the panel, we will be taking audience questions in about 30 minutes or so via ccga.liv. Simply enter ccga.liv into your browser. Follow the on-screen prompts and you'll be able to submit or vote for your favorite question there. With that said, I'd like to welcome our panelists to this conversation. Hirel Haberkorn is a professor of Southeast Asia Studies at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, where her research focuses on state violence and dissident cultural politics in Thailand. Prithika, Prithika excuse me, Varagar is a columnist at the Wall Street Journal and spent four years as a foreign correspondent in Southeast Asia and South Asia writing on religion, politics, and fundamentalism. Finally, Anna Whitelock is a head of the Department of History, as well as co-director of the Center for the Study of Modern Monarchy at Royal Holiday, Holloway, University of London. Welcome everyone, and thank you so much for joining us. We don't have a lot of time, so let's jump right into it. Monarchies, kings, queens, princes, princesses, Empires, colonies, these are words that we hear, they conjure up thoughts of a distant era, or maybe royal weddings. But they are surprisingly common words in today's world, resilient, if you will. A goal of our discussion today is to understand this resiliency and the influence that monarchies continue to hold in the world. I thought a great way to start our conversation is to ask each of you to share your views based on your respective regional expertise on why it is that monarchies are resilient. Anna, would you like to begin? Thank you, yes. Um, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak. Um, yeah, I mean, reflecting on the British monarchy, of course, and when I say the British monarchy, we need to remember that um, the British monarchy is also head of state in uh, 15 other countries, New Zealand, Canada, Australia, and um, nine countries in the Caribbean. So we have to remember in that context. Um, I mean, first and foremost, the, the British monarchy and the monarch is popular. But the, the problem that we have in analyzing this is given the longevity of the queen, it's hard to kind of disaggregate the popularity of the queen from the popularity and sort of durability of the monarchy. Um, and I think we're not going to know quite whether the queen personifies the sort of popularity of monarchy or whether in fact she commands a very particular respect in many ways because she's sort of the last of a particular type of monarch which people regard as you know, not to be seen again. Um, and I suppose, Although the, the, the monarchy, uh, the British monarchy has um, evolved and it has evolved in recent years, um, largely because it's had to. It's also, of course, and this is true of monarchies across the piece, it's marked by and underpinned by continuity. And in a world of great change, continuity um, can be um, a reassuring asset. Um, so those would be my initial thoughts. Great. Krithika, would you like to continue? Sure. Um, the area that I write about um, mainly and report from is the Islamic world. And I've written a lot about the influence of one particular um, country, which is Saudi Arabia, the birthplace of Islam and one of the most resilient modern monarchies and one of the most powerful modern states that is a monarchy. 
Um, the prevalence of the monarchy form across the Gulf states is kind of a surprising counterbalance to, you know, what people like Samuel Huntington might have predicted just 10 or 20 or 30 years ago, which is that a monarchy must devolve some of its authority to constitutional mechanisms in order to keep going. Many countries in the Gulf have not done that and they're doing just fine. But I think the key when we're looking at this region, um, especially in Saudi Arabia, which is a country of great interest to me and I think everyone here is to uh, not generalize. You could say in general, a lot of monarchic systems arose um, in the wake of colonialism, but in the case of Saudi Arabia, it was actually never colonized. Or we could say that in the Middle East, um, monarchies have been more um, powerful than in other parts of the world. But it's in one of those very countries, Iran, that a monarchy was most spectacularly overthrown by a populist uprising. So I think, you know, with this part of the world or with any part of the world, it's great to take um, every monarchy on its own terms, even though they share some features in common. All right, thank you so much. And Tyrell, please. It's, it's fascinating. Uh, it's great to it's great to be having this conversation. Fascinating to hear comparative insights from from the UK and from across um, from across uh, the Islamic world. In the case of Thailand, which is which is where my research is focused, Thailand has been a has been a monarchy for for hundreds of years. Um, Siam before it before it became Thailand more recently. In 1932, there's a transition from absolute to constitutional monarchy. But in the intervening almost 90 years, consolidating that constitutional regime has been very challenging. So I think what's most crucial in terms of understanding the place of the Thai monarchy and how it has remained resilient, which it has, very, it's very resilient over the last 90 years, um, has been repression and authoritarianism. That is how, that is how the Thai monarchy keeps keeps its power and keeps um, keeps its position within the polity. And I would just note that the key, a key piece of this, there are many others, is uh, the very repressive, repressive Les Majesty Law, Article 112, which provides for punishment of three to 15 years imprisonment per count um, of alleged defamation, insult, or threat to uh, the king, queen, heir apparent, or regent. For those of you who have followed news over the last six to seven years, under another military regime, uh, sentences have reached as high as 35 years for Facebook posts, um, for graffiti in bathrooms, uh, theater plays, all sorts of all sorts of very sort of ordinary expressions. So, so I would that's where I would that's where I would end. Great. So, starting off, thank you each one of you for kind of offering that initial overview and. As the audience can see, we have kind of a wide range of regions represented here, and monarchies are resilient in a variety of regions throughout the world. It's not just a British monarchy, even though that is typically what we maybe have, a lot of folks might have immediately come to mind. One question I want to do, and I really want to pick back up on the idea, it was mentioned about Huntington, right, and, and the ideas of Huntington, but when I think about monarchies, I think about how this contrasts to another writer who became very prominent at the time that, say, Huntington's Clash of Civilizations was becoming prominent, and that was Francis Fukuyama. And of course, he's famous for the phrase, end of history, and about how at the end of the Cold War, that was it. Liberal democracy will now spread throughout the world, and, you know, and, and that's it. That's, that's the dominant system, and that will end and become the dominant system. That hasn't happened. And in fact, if anything, as we're talking about today, there seems to be, first of all, a bit of a retrenchment with respect to democracy, but also these monarchies have done anything but, at least that's been my sense, has done anything but move in that direction that Fukuyama uh, predicted. So I'd very much like to hear how is it that democracy, how is it that monarchies have been able to manage kind of this the global democratization that happened at the Cold War, and how is it that they were able to, if you will, resist that move towards an end of history. Very much like to open that up to any one of you who'd like to answer it. I mean, I think it, it is notable that, um, you know, in Europe, some of the, the sort of biggest um, and most noted democracies, and indeed some of the biggest and most noted democracies in the world are monarchies. Um, and of course that just seems to be 
um, an entirely, uh, you know, conflicted state. But I mean, I guess it's important to acknowledge, and you know, and the Queen herself, actually, Queen Elizabeth um, acknowledged um, at the time of her um, Golden Jubilee that. Um, I mean, she said here, if I just quote her, she said, despite the huge constitutional difference between a hereditary monarchy and an elected government, in reality, the gulf is not so wide. They are complementary institutions, each with its own role to play. Each in its different way exists only with the support and the consent of the people. That consent or lack of it is expressed for you, Prime Minister, through the ballot box. It is a tough, even brutal system but at least the message is clear for us all to read. For us, a royal family, however, the message is often harder to read, obscured as it is by deference, but read it we must. And so I guess there's a sense that, you know, popular assent and popular consent is an important part um, of sustaining a monarchy too. Kritika, either of you wish to add to this about kind of the relationship of foul, I, it, this is an interesting point about kind of our monarchies in some respects, maybe even kind of picking up on this point that Anna brought up, maybe even more closer to democracies than they are, say, to what we think of as like a stereotypical autocracy. Either one of you wish to pick up on this. I'm happy to jump in briefly to say, um, to offer, I think I a contrasting view, which is that in Thailand, the monarchy has, has been largely opposed to democracy. But what I think is most significant is that there's been a new, very, I think, powerful and exciting push for democracy from not only youth activists, but led by youth activists since last July. And the key demand of the activists and the one in which many of them are now facing a series of court cases over has been to reform the monarchy to actually be in line with, with democracy. And I think that this, even though they have maintained that their goal is not to topple the monarchy, but to, to make it in a sense appropriate, appropriately aligned with the constitution, it's been incredibly threatening, not only to the institution itself, but also its allies within the military and, and the judiciary. Um, so I think this question of how, how to bring a monarchy that has that has been absolutist and that has operated with close ties to other repressive institutions, even in line with democracy, let alone to support or foster a more fulsome democracy is, is very challenging. Um, with regards to the end of history um, point, I think what the Gulf states show us is that there are a lot of ways for countries to develop and most of them, it turns out, haven't developed in the Western European model. Um, so in the case of Saudi Arabia, which in its current form is a very young country, the kingdom was only consolidated in 1932, um, it turned out that the monarchy or the monarchic state could provide most of the um, welfare and state-like functions that are needed in a modern country that, for example, hosts the G20 summit today and has a seat at the UN and so on, without ever making any kind of concession to voting or democracy or citizen participation. I mean, Saudi Arabia has often been called a rentier state because it does give a lot, it pays back a lot of its oil wealth to its citizens. Many Saudis up until recently were used to, you know, getting uh, kind of sinecures or cushy jobs just for being a Saudi. They get free health insurance, which is more than a lot of people in Western countries can say, speaking for myself. Um, and they get a lot of other things from this monarchy run state that just has, is also to um, Terrell's point, is incredibly repressive and allows no room for dissent, especially in its current state. So if you combine those two things, providing most of the state life functions while just being crushingly authoritarian and having no consequences for it, in part because of their um, Western alliances and position in the world, um, it's, it, there's no clear end point for this kind of monarchy. There's no need for them to necessarily make concessions in the near future, although anything can you know, change at any moment. But so far, any democratic movements have been brutally crushed and driven into exile in the modern Saudi state. I'd like to stick for a moment with Saudi Arabia, um, because, and then I want 
all three of you to speak to this, but Saudi Arabia in particular poses a challenge for something that is indeed of great interest to folks who are affiliated with the Chicago Council. Of course, Chicago Council, big part of it is thinking about US foreign policy. And so what does it mean for the United States that we have, people like to refer to special relationships that the US has, right? And of course, people will refer to this with the British, but one of these other countries is indeed Saudi Arabia. What does it mean for the United States that a number of its key special relations are with monarchies, even though the United States is supposed to be this bastion of democracy around the globe. People refer to the liberal international order led by the United States. And yet, as I've heard time and again repeated already, it supports countries, monarchies, that resort to repressive measures. What does this say about US foreign policy? Well, it's not an accident that we've been able to ally with some of the monarchies in this region, particularly because um, in the Middle East, Saudi Arabia has kind of been a stalwart while many other countries in the region faced kind of nationalist revivals or you know, faced currents of Arab socialism and things like that. And it was a tumultuous post-war and post-colonial period across most of North Africa and the Middle East. So in contrast to that, a country like Saudi Arabia and also some of our other uh, allies in the region loosely, like Bahrain and Kuwait to different degrees. It's just easier to um, negotiate with them out of necessity because we have so many different strategic interests there from oil to security to you know some of the forever worth that we're entrenched in there. So out of necessity because of how much we're entangled in the Middle East, it's um, it would be hard to disentangle from any of those relationships. With regards to what we could do with that relationship, um, I don't think it's the pro I don't think it's problematic that we ally with a country that has a monarchy. I think the problem arises in the fact that we ally with countries that have such terrible human rights records. And when you are a country with as many cards to play as the US, um, it's imperative to at least use some of that capital to pressure those countries to improve the records. I don't think that we can or, or would or would even try to change the nature of their governance structure. But for example, with something like the Khashoggi affair, only a country like America has any cards to play in holding a country like Saudi Arabia to account. So I think that's where the bilateral relationship comes in. And it should be noted that after 9-11, we did, US and some of its Western allies, successfully pressure um, Saudi Arabia to clean up many of its financial outflows, especially in terror finance. So the impossible can be done, especially when countries like the US apply pressure. So I think um, it's a complicated relationship, but I definitely don't think um, it's it's all bad or, or anything like that. I think, you know, if anything, we have uh, are in a pretty good position to improve um, conditions on a lot of fronts there. Well, would you say a similar dynamic unfolds with respect to the monarchies that you study and, and in particular their relations with vis-a-vis -vis the United States that maybe in some ways that the U.S. is, it kind of avoids maybe the worst possible situation, even though it might not be the best from an appearance standpoint for the U.S. to be allied with these countries? I do agree. And I, I also agree that, that the challenge posed by monarchies is not, uh, or with U.S., uh, U.S. relations with monarchies isn't simply that that it's a monarchy, it's that it's a monarchy that is embedded in a state in engaging in authoritarian repressive actions. In the case of Thailand, it's it's somewhat resonant, I think somewhat different from, from the Gulf states. Um, the resonance is that uh, the U.S. Since, uh, since the beginning of the Cold War has had a longstanding relationship with the Thai monarchy and military. And actually after 1932 and the end of absent monarchy, um, the, the monarchy had, had begun to fade in importance within, uh, within Thailand. It was largely brought back through collaboration between, uh, between the CIA and, and the Thai military when they realized that during the Cold War, shoring up the monarchy and developing the monarchy would be a useful tool to combat communism in the region and throughout um, throughout the U.S. wars in Vietnam, Thailand was was the base of operations for the U.S. So, so there's this long-standing relationship that's, of course, no longer relevant in the present moment. I think, in many ways, the challenge, the challenge with with foreign policy, either U.S.-led foreign policy or EU or really or Australian, and sort of anybody who's interested in Thailand, the difficulty actually, I think, is 
is changing the perception that Thailand is something other than a tourism and manufacturing paradise. <laughs> um, people are often very surprised when they hear that, that there's repression going on in Thailand because that is not the image that the country has, um, has globally, globally at all. So I think there is, there is a tremendous amount of space to, to, challenge, uh, to challenge the Thai government over, uh, over repression of human rights. It's certainly been very effective in terms of trafficking. So I think in terms of freedom of expression, political freedom, there is a lot of space and a lot of space um, for, uh, for US government actors to, to be helpful in, in affecting support for rights. So Anna, you know, Kritika and Tyrell both deal with a certain type of monarchy, as was pointed out. And so this relationship of the United States vis-a-vis -vis these countries is, as we've been talking about, maybe a little bit more problematic and troublesome. Obviously, with yours, it's it's a different, as you already pointed out, the, the monarchy relationship for a lot of the countries you study is a little bit different. Nevertheless, do you also have a sense of where maybe at times you know, how does this fit with the U.S.'s overall goals of, you know, especially if we think about the British, like, wait, didn't we fight a war in order not to honor a monarchy there? And yet this is also very common for U.S. presidents to go and visit monarchies. So I can still see where there might be some awkwardness vis-a-vis -vis U.S. foreign policy with respect to the countries you study. So I'd like to hear your thoughts as well on this. Yeah, I mean, you're absolutely right. There is that irony that, of course, the Americans overthrew and got rid of uh, the British monarchy. And that at the same time, there's this kind of American love affair in many ways with the British monarchy and the royal family. And again, I think the person of the Queen is a huge factor. But I mean, I think it's important to reflect on how the, the British royals are being used as this kind of British soft power and the extent to which other countries or, or indeed how they engage with them and you know and what that says i mean you know quite deliberately at, at the uh, at the g7 in cornwall you know the members of the royal family were scattered all over the place um and you know there's no doubt that during the period of the brexit debate in the united kingdom um the the royals were sent across Europe as these sort of ambassadors sort of trying to, in a sense, curate a foreign policy that was apparently very benign. It was just about shaking hands and smiling and promoting brand Britain. And of course, you know, in some ways that's great for Britain, the United Kingdom, and it does have a kind of potency and, and a power, but how that is received and should be received from uh, within other countries, I think is, is interesting. Um, and of course, you know, the British monarchy's problems of late, it, uh, the, the extended, which is one of the other problems with this sort of modern monarchy is modern monarchies who have a, a, lot, a, a large number of hangers on or large members of the royal, royal family make that it very problematic. And, I, you know, to make a, have a smaller monarchy means it's more manageable. And of course, you know, one has to consider the implications of the scandal around Prince Andrew, for example, and the implications for that. Um, and of course, you know, Harry and Meghan and Megxit and what that says about the British monarchy's willingness, you know, to, or certainly the, you know, the Buckingham Palace's willingness to engage and embrace a, a new kind of future. Uh, represented by the marriage of Harry and Meghan. So I think we're in a bit of a time warp in that, um, you know, the Queen, of course, was has seen so many American presidents. Her first prime minister was Winston Churchill. And I think there is a kind of, you know, talking to people around the world, they refer to the Queen of the United Kingdom as, well, she's just the Queen. And she's kind of this you, you Queen that's kind of ubiquitous and, and sort of above countries. And I think in a way, this means that the big questions about the role, the relevance, and the sort of um, durability of the British monarchy sort of remain in a state of suspended animation until she passes. And then I think there really will be big questions about how the royal family could and should be used as these kind as dip, you know, as diplomats on the royal tours, which of course have always been such an important role. Um, you know, state banquets. This this fine line between being very apolitical, but also right in the cut and thrust of politics is gonna be a hard line to walk, particularly 
with the prospect of Prince Charles becoming king, when who has become, you know, much more outspoken and, and engaged on a whole range of issues. So the idea of this monarch above politics, which is, and a constitutional monarch really like no other. I mean, you know, she's kind of lived that role to, to perfection almost. Um, I think that will raise questions um, about Britain's place in the world as, as sort of acted out through its monarchy. I'm really glad you brought up the term soft power because this really goes to one of the last questions that I want to ask the three of you before we turn to um, the audience questions. And just as a reminder, I already see that there are some questions being posted into the chat. Please do so for those of you who are watching. Uh, again, ccga.liv is where you can place those questions. But the last one is you, you mentioned the idea of soft power and about how you know, the monarchy, at least in, with respect to a lot of the European monarchies, and of course with the British, can play this role of being like a representative of the country, but doesn't have actual political power. And obviously that contrasts very mightily with monarchies, a number of monarchies throughout the world, including ones we've talked about today. What I'd like to hear from each one of the three of you is kind of the opposite of the question that is motivating this entire talk today. So we're talking about the resiliency of monarchies, especially the resiliency of them as political actors, not just as, say, symbolic actors. What would it take for them to cease to be political actors? What would it require for us to have a conversation, say, 10 years from now or 20 years from now, where we talk about how monarchies are no longer politically active on the world stage? I'd love to hear the thoughts from each one of you with respect to that question. I'll, I'll jump in why everyone's to just, I mean, I'm not sure that it, I, I can imagine a time really, because I mean, if, if you're suggesting that the monarch remains head of state, um, then they're still gonna have a political role. And, you know, the, whether it be a purely sort of ceremonial symbolic role, I mean, that says a lot about national identity and how countries are perceived or want to be perceived. So I don't think, um, you know, I, I can't see a time when you have a monarch as a head of state that would somehow just be seen as their sort of for decoration or as some kind of, you know, the sort of ultimate celebrity royal family, a celebrity family, you know, it, it, it could never be like that. So I'm not sure that you could ever take the politics out. And the question is, you know, what, it, what how are we defining those politics and, and how significant and, and sort of potent they can be? Rokritika, either of you wish to? Yes, please. Yeah, um, I, um, I, I don't really see um, a future for the Gulf without monarchies either, because we've seen, um, you know, the two major ways that governments can change in this region. One is from the bottom up, which the Arab Spring uprisings, which nearly every monarchy in the region was very resilient against, um, mainly because they had these modern tools of um, suppressing dissent. Um, and authoritarianism. And the other way that governments change in the Middle East is if America invades them and tries to do it that way. And that hasn't worked out that great in any of those countries either. Um, so I just don't see any substantial regime change happening in the Gulf in the near future. And moreover, all the monarchies in questions in question here are very competent at providing state-like functions to their citizens. And um, I don't see um, I don't see a huge path or demand for overthrowing that. And they've actually, I think a misconception about these monarchies, even though they have such a bad human rights regime, is they do kind of look after their citizens and are somewhat responsive in the way that a democracy would be to the needs of their people. So in Saudi Arabia, for instance, um, the very authoritarian style Crown Prince MBS has single-handedly eliminated the religious police because it wasn't popular. Um, he's introduced a lot of new freedoms and types of events for the young people there, and he's created a lot of jobs there, which um, are things that a democratically elected government would do too. So while he has this terrible and repressive style of governance, he's also giving, he's also responsive to what young people in Saudi Arabia want, because he himself is a millennial. So I think that kind of thing happens in, to some degree in all the other monarchies, which is why I think they have been so resilient in this century. 
I think the, the question, the question of what would it take for monarchies to cease to be politically active is a fascinating one. I am also, I do not foresee massive regime change in Thailand either. I think the really important, the really important challenge going forward would be actually to even clarify the ways in which the Thai monarchy is politically active. I think that's in many ways so much of the repression that that takes place and so much of the difficulty of challenging it is that the monarchy isn't above politics. The monarchy is very much involved in politics, but precisely because of the Liz Majesty law, precisely because of the monarchy's relationship with the military and judiciary, even ascertaining all of the ways in which it's politically active isn't currently possible. Um, so I think before, uh, before it would be possible to think about the monarchy not being politically active, the first piece is to be able to actually gain concrete answers to how it is politically active. And I suspect that will be very challenging and difficult going forward. This is great. Those are terrific questions. And I should add that that question also kind of echoes one of the first questions that in the chat from the audience, which was, uh, do we think there'll be fewer monarchies, maybe not an elimination of them, but will there be fewer in the future, uh, say 50 years in the next 50 years than there are right now? Um, but I think there are a lot of good answers given for why we can envision them being very continuing to be resilient. So with that, I'd like to turn to some of the audience questions. And we have a variety of questions that are being asked right now. And again, for those of you who are watching, you can continue to add the questions. We'll do this for the next 15 minutes. Um, one thing I want to do is, this is a continuation of what we've been talking about. But kind of what, one question that seems popular here is, do you think dynastic ties and relationships will still have weight in contemporary diplomatic settings? Like to what extent can that, again, that soft power that's given by someone being a monarch, can that continue to have weight in diplomatic settings or will it go more the direction of where they truly are figureheads? I mean, can we envision a future where even if the monarchs aren't the heads of government, they can actually play a astute diplomatic role? And I think that's one question that people are interested about. Again, for me, I think about when studying like the late 19th century, early 20th century, we think about the princes and they're also kind of serving this dual role as diplomats. Can we see that in the future or will there actually be less of a desire for monarchs to actually be playing a role in diplomacy? I, I think perhaps it depends on, on the monarch and the monarchy because I'm not sure that, I mean, certainly the British monarchy, I'm not sure that they would actively say that they would see themselves as playing a role in diplomacy or, or see themselves as diplomats. I mean, you know, it, it, they are sent to countries by the, the Foreign and Commonwealth Office. I mean, they, they work at the behest of government. Um, and so I'm, I'm not sure that there's a sense in which they would be able to curate a different kind of way of being. I mean, having said that, I can imagine, I mean, again, talking, you know, from my area of interest and expertise, I mean, something like um, Prince Charles, when he becomes king, I mean, he's, he's talked a lot about um, his passion for the environment. And I can imagine him kind of leading on global, you know, environmental symposia or, you know, coming together of countries. And I think that's, the environment is quite an interesting area because, of course, it, it's hugely political for so many reasons. Um, but at the same time, it's somehow seen as other and therefore perhaps an, an area that's sort of of benign, common, um, you know, concern that that whereby a monarch like him could push uh, push themselves forward to have a global role. I think that could be quite interesting. I mean, just in terms of the resilience of monarchies, I would also say that I think there is a good chance that um, a number of countries in the Caribbean may well have referenda and um, no longer have uh, the UK monarch as head of state. I mean, there's already murmurings there. So I think um, I wouldn't say, you know, in terms of the number of monarchies, I think that we may see countries peeling away, certainly from um, the, the UK monarchy. Or T. Rell, would either of you like to add to this? I'll jump in briefly to say that I think as long as monarchs exercise 
political power, there will con the dynast dynastic ties will continue to have weight in diplomatic settings. Um, as long, I think, particularly in contexts where uh, where monarchs exercise um, exercise are not are not synonymous with the state, but exercise influence within the state. Of course, they're going to be of interest as um, as a channel of access of access to power. Um, I just want to add that one of the kind of the, the key um, you know, benefits or, you know, accoutrements of monarchy is the kind of iconography of it. And in the Saudi case, the iconography of the Saudi, Saudi royal family, the thobe, the kind of um, headdress that you can picture them wearing and in, in the kingdom, when they do things like sword dances and bring you out into the desert and things like that, um, they're all helpful to cement the identity of a country that is actually very young. So, um, you know, nation states have, or, mod, you know, democratic governments have their own um, branding and things like that, but there's just nothing that um, compares in, in the English case. It's so obvious with when you see all the kind of visual culture of the English monarchy that's so powerful. Um, the same thing is true in Saudi Arabia, and I think it's an asset for their diplomatic relations. As much as Saudi Arabia presents this kind of um, dusty desert kingdom with a bad track record, when you do see people um, you know, one of our one of the closest diplomats to us was Prince Bandar, um, who's very close to the Bushes and was a close ally in counterterrorism. He always wore the traditional dress of his family and represented his royal family in the U.S. And I think that iconography has this kind of affective pull in diplomatic settings, um, and and it's hard to shake that off in these contexts. And that I think that's true across many Gulf monarchies in the way they present themselves in diplomatic settings. So th this is great because that particular question was kind of coming from it from almost like a top down, thinking about it at the diplomatic level, the higher level. There's another question that seems very popular here that is about kind of the average citizen. And basically it's asking the question, and then this you can think about this question either way that you wish to go. And I think what would be interesting would be for each one of you to talk about it as it pertains within the countries that you have an expertise in, which is, do you think the average citizen, how have the perceptions of the monarchy changed over, say, the past 10 years, 30 years, 15 years? Has the monarchy become more popular, less popular? You know, there's been talks about you know, policies that have been pursued, some of which are repressive. You could imagine that working against it, but also policies pursued that provide public goods. And so does that help? But I think it would be interesting for people to know, and there seems to be a desire to know, like, how are the monarchies actually being perceived within the countries themselves? Are they more popular or less popular? Hero, why don't we start with you, if you have a view on this? Sure. So there's been a dramatic shift in Thailand around the monarchy, and it's because there was a transition um, on October 13th, 2016, Rama the Ninth, or Bumipon Adunyade, who at, at the time of his death was the longest reigning monarch in the world, died, and he he was he became uh, he became king after the untimely death of his older brother, and he reigned throughout throughout the Cold War. Um, so he was he was the monarch who was there when when the monarchy as an institution was brought back as a key defense against communism, both, both institutionally, but also very much in a, in a cultural political sense as well. His son, uh, Mahavadya Longhorn Rama X, became king after him and, um, and is, is, far less, is far less popular than his father. Um, for, you know, for a variety of reasons. And I think you know, most significantly, he also, um, he's also made a number of changes, including putting several, uh, several military units under his personal command, changing the constitution, the latest constitution, Thailand's 20th since 32, um, after it had been passed by referendum. Um, all of these things, as well as all sorts of unanswered and unanswerable questions about, um, about the institution's involvement in politics, in extrajudicial violence, in courts, has raised a number of questions. And so the broad, um, the broad legitimacy and love felt for his father is, um, is far more tenuous in his case. And I think something I would, would wanna conclude by saying is that this movement that has grown up in the past year is remarkable because Although there's 
all sorts, I mean, even though there's Article 112, the Les Majesty Law, of course, ordinary citizens talk about the monarchy all the time. You have convert, every, you know, you, it's impossible in some ways to, I think, to have any conversation that doesn't at some point touch on the institution or the individuals. The difference is that what youth activists have done has have taken that whispered gossip and put it into very rigorous, very direct questions about the role of the institution in politics. And in some ways, I think that's why they're being, that's why there's an attempt to shut them down because they are making explicit and clear longstanding, longstanding questions. And I think that however many court cases are thrown at them, that's actually just going to continue to grow. Um, so I think that's where the, that's where the average citizen uh, is at this moment. I mean, Prithika, do you, do you get a sense within Saudi Arabia of, you know, as you pointed out, there's this pursuit of providing even more public goods. The government has done a good job. There's been a lot of new reform. One thing, I guess, to kind of build on this question, are those reforms leading to more popularity or are those reforms because there was actually a decline in popularity and this was viewed as a way of kind of rebolstering it? But how does this question of kind of the average citizen within Saudi Arabia, what is their perception of the popularity of the monarchy there? You know, there, there aren't exactly uh, Pew research polls in Saudi Arabia to capture public sentiment at any given time. So it's not an exact science. But I think um, in part because MBS, who's about five years into his reign now, is so young and was so online, he's said to grow up, have grown up addicted to Facebook and playing video games and so on. He was in touch with some of the um, um, dissatisfaction of the younger generation that makes up the majority of Saudi Arabia more so than his predecessors. Um, and some of the reforms he made do seem broadly popular um, among young Saudis. That being said, he, because he's such a um, large presence, when we talk about the monarchy, he's by far the most powerful person in the kingdom. And he has a kind of blundering style where he makes big mistakes on a big scale, for example, the Khashoggi affair, um, it's quite possible that one of his reforms designed to make life better for young Saudis will fall flat and will be unpopular. But that's kind of the iterative process of his governing style as we've seen it so far. So I'd say a lot of the big changes he made early in his term are being well received, especially because economic malaise is so widespread there, um, especially among um, Saudis who've gotten smaller and smaller welfare um, payments than their parents. So I think in broad strokes, the monarchy is more popular now than it was a few years ago. Um, but, you know, the human rights record is not just an asterisk. Um, the amount of offenses that could get you on the bad side of that regime are so vast. He's even kneecapped the religious establishment that many of us associate so much with Saudi Arabia. Um, the clerics are no longer the, are as powerful as they were just five years ago. Um, even qualified, you know, anything less than full-throated praise for the regime, anything close to critique, um, anything close to um, unsanctioned activism that he doesn't personally rubber stamp could just get you straight in jail or tortured or worse. So I would say he's popular in broad strokes, but there are a lot of um, exceptions to that. And also his style makes me think that he'll make some unpopular moves in the near future. And then Anna, my perception is that the British monarchy is more popular in the United States than in the UK. But is that is that perception correct? Well, I mean, it is a perception. I mean, people often think that, and there's a kind of easy generalization that younger people are opposed to the monarchy and older people support it. But actually, I mean, talking to my undergraduate students sort of 18, 19 year olds, I mean, it's always refreshing to be proved wrong and that actually it's a much more varied opinion base. Um, and, and recent Mori polls um, suggest, I mean, it's an overwhelming popularity. I mean, the majority supports the monarchy. Now, again, whether this is actually support for a very old queen who people feel like you know has done her her job pretty well and there's a great deal of respect for her whether that actually will translate into um, enduring support for the monarchy I think definitely remains to be seen um, but there's no doubt that the, I mean the British monarchy has tried to modernize itself um, perhaps in a way that's going to become problematic because part of that modernization has been in many ways 
to the younger roles have tried to appear like everybody else and, and sort of emphasize their normality. Now, for those who are not directly going to succeed, then that's fine. But for someone like Prince William, um, that sort of quest for pushing this kind of, you know, we're like you, is going to become rather difficult when at his coronation there's, you know, the anointing which somehow sets him above everybody else. So there seems to be a kind of incongruity between this sort of modernising and, and push towards trying to be accessible and normal with, of course, ultimately the idea of the British monarchy as it is at the moment with an anointing, um, a, a monarch as, as head of state and head of the established church wanting to of course at the same time uh, represent a very diverse society so there's lots of problems coming down the line I think and I think we're just kind of waiting for those debates um, to kick off uh, you know whenever that time comes. So we're at our time but I have to ask this last question because it is very popular in the chat here and we can just do this as like a lightning round very quickly of like yes and this. So there's a question about, do any of you foresee a new monarchy coming about? You know, we've talked about retrenchment, we've talked about resiliency, but are there any countries where you see either the establishment, the reestablishment of an old monarchy or the creation of a new monarchy that you could see on the horizon? Again, it seems to be a very popular question. So we'll just go really quickly. We'll just start with Tyrell. Do you foresee this? I do not. Uh, the but is that um, I may be sort of foreseen by by our challenges to both Fukuyama and Huntington. I think the the kinds of regimes that we're seeing at this moment, we can take nothing for granted. <laughs> um, I think uh, so. I would say I don't see one, but but who knows? Um, if I had to guess, it would happen anywhere. Maybe maybe in Europe. But I don't see in Asia and Africa a, a new monarchy coming out anytime soon. Well, that that lends it right over very nicely to Anna. What do you do? You foresee the establishment or the emergence of a new monarchy? I don't. I'm interested by the point about Europe. I don't see it. I mean, I would say that, of course, you know, in the U.S., you have you know sort of dynasties um, over time, sort of remaining uh, present. I mean, you could think about the kind of the Clintons and the Bushes and so on. Um, so I'm not sure of monarchy as we know it, but but political leaders um, that uh, really sort of pass power across generations and, and down dynasties funded by by wealth, perhaps a new kind of inherited power, as it were, but perhaps not a monarchy as we'd understand it. Yeah, I, that reminds me of a phrase I once heard someone say to me, which is in the, uh, in the United States, we have uh, dynasties without the benefits of a monarchy. And so I think that this is a, an interesting point for us to be ending on. And so with that, I want to thank everyone for tuning in live for this event. Um, I learned a lot from it. I really want to thank our panelists. Um, as a reminder, a recording of this conversation will also be available for playback on the council's uh, social channels and websites shortly. It'll be going out on social media, Twitter, LinkedIn, et cetera. Um, so thanks again to our panelists for joining us today for the program. It was a pleasure chatting with each one of you and thank you all again for joining us.